Hello friends, my name is Joseph. I'm speaking to you from the campus of Harvard University in the USA. To my right is Memorial Church, built in 1932 in memory of members of the Harvard community who perished in World War I. To my left, we saw Widener Library, named for Harry Elkins Widener, who was a member of the class of 1907 and who unfortunately was aboard the Titanic when it sank in the Atlantic Ocean. His mother later gave money to Harvard to build a new library. Behind me is Seaver Hall, S-E-V-E-R. Seaver Hall is a classroom building which has been in use by Harvard students since 1880. In 1894, Swami Vivekananda gave a talk in this very building. One could ask at the outset, why should we even be interested in an event that happened over 120 years ago? Is there any relevance to the modern world? As a student of the life and work of Swami Vivekananda, I can say with confidence that his ideas have a timeless character and everyone can benefit by following his teachings. So let's take a look at a newspaper report that describes the Swami's talk. This is from the student newspaper, the Harvard Crimson. I'll read you the article. The Harvard Crimson, Cambridge, Mass, Thursday, May 17th, 1894. Vivekananda's Address. Swami Vivekananda, the Hindu monk, gave an address last evening in Seaver Hall under the auspices of the Harvard Religious Union. The address was very interesting. The clear and eloquent voice of the speaker and his low, earnest delivery making his words singularly impressive. There are various sects and doctrines in India, said Vivekananda some of which accept the theory of a personal God and others which believe that God and the universe are one. But whatever sect the Hindu belongs to, he does not say that his is the only right belief and that all others must be wrong. He believes that there are many ways of coming to God that a man who is truly religious rises above the petty quarrels of sect or creed. In India, if a man believes that he is a spirit, a soul, and not a body, then he is said to have religion, and not till then. To become a monk in India, it is necessary to lose all thought of the body, to look upon other human beings as souls, so monks can never marry. Two vows are taken when a man becomes a monk, poverty and chastity. He is not allowed to receive or possess any money whatever. The first ceremony to be performed on joining the order is to be burnt in effigy, which is supposed to destroy once for all the old body 
name, and caste. The man then receives a new name and is allowed to go forth and preach or travel, but must take no money for what he does. So we see that the reporter emphasized two important points from Swami Vivekananda's talk. First, the harmony of religions. This is one of the core messages of Vedanta. Second, the reporter mentioned that Swamiji discussed the monastic ideal. And here, here we have to remember that the audience for this talk was mainly composed of young men who were interested in religion. So it's natural that Swami Vivekananda would discuss the glories of monasticism. We also notice that Swami Vivekananda used masculine pronouns all throughout his talk. But we understand that his ideas transcend gender. Another interesting point is that Swami Vivekananda gave a talk at Redcliffe College about one week before the event in Seaver. Redcliffe was a women's college nearby where classes were given by the same professors who taught at Harvard. What did Swami Vivekananda say at Radcliffe? More research is needed to determine that. Swami Vivekananda was invited to speak at Harvard for a second time about two years later. This talk took place in Dane Hall, D-A-N-E. Dane Hall was a small wooden building in the southwest corner of Harvard Yard. Dane Hall is no longer in existence, but it was formerly the home of the Harvard Law School before they moved to a new building in 1883, which incidentally was designed by the same architect who designed Seaver Hall. In this case, Swami Vivekananda was invited by the Graduate Philosophical Society. His talk took place on the upper floor of Dane Hall in the Psychological Laboratory. Now, why would philosophers need a laboratory? In the 1890s, there was no clear distinction in academia between philosophy and psychology. In fact, it was the work of Professor William James which defined experimental psychology as an academic discipline. And it was Professor James who built this psychological laboratory beginning in 1890. Professor James attended Swami Vivekananda's talk and he invited the Swami to his house for lunch a few days later. This talk was published in booklet form soon after the talk was given, so the full text is available. And I'll read you some excerpts from the concluding paragraph. According to the Advaita philosophy then, this differentiation of matter, these phenomena are, as it were, for a time, hiding the real nature of man. 
But the ladder really has not changed at all. If a man is deluded by a mirage for some time, and one day the mirage disappears, if it comes back again the next day, or at some future time, he will not be deluded. Before the mirage first broke, the man could not distinguish between the reality and the deception. But when it has once broken, as long as he has organs and eyes to work with, he will see the image, but will no more be deluded. That fine distinction between the actual world and the mirage he has caught, and the latter cannot delude him anymore. So, when the Venantist has realized his own nature, the whole world has vanished for him. It will come back again, but no more the same world of misery. The prison of misery has become changed into Sat, Chit, Ananda, existence absolute, knowledge absolute, bliss absolute, and the attainment of this is the goal of the Advaita philosophy. So we've seen two examples of what Swami Vivekananda said at an academic institution in America. What did he say about education in India? I'll read a short excerpt from this book. Speaking in Madras, 14th February of 1897, Swami Vivekananda said, Education is not the amount of information that is put into your brain and runs riot there, undigested all your life. We must have life-building, man-making, character-making assimilation of ideas. If you have assimilated five ideas and made them your life and character, you have more education than any man who has got by heart the whole library. Friends, assimilating five ideas may take a very long time. Let's start with one. My appeal to you is to study the life and work of Swami Vivekananda. Find one idea that appeals to you and live it. Thank you for your kind attention.